how do we value nature? How can we value nature? And uh, this is a very controversial issue within ecological economics, I should say, that um, there are those of us who believe that uh, um, nature is you know, tremendously valuable, but we can't really come up with precise values, and we certainly can't come up with monetary values. Well, there are others that believe we should be calculating monetary values. I believe it was Bill Reese who said, well, how does a parasite value its host? I mean, you know, without it, we're gone. There is nothing. Clearly nature has functions so the com complexity of ecosystems have have functions those functions which we value as human beings we often call those services so e ecological or ecosystem services um, the question has been all right well how do we value those services how do we bring those into public discourse how do we get decision makers to recognize those things that have value to us whether you put a dollar value on those or not and there's two broad camps. One is sort of the single metric camp, whether that be put everything into energy units or put everything into dollar units. It's a single metric. So you're saying, let's take apples and oranges, and the only way to compare them is to put them all in common terms. The other camp is um, a more pluralistic camp that says that we can evaluate apples and oranges in their own units. We can do this in a multi-criteria way. We can ask people to make trade-offs, you know, and if those trade-offs are in carbon units in one metric and in dollars in another metric and in um, you know aesthetic beauty in another metric people are able to make those trade-offs we do it all the time we do it every day we make trade-offs in our family choices and our community choices and they don't they don't have to be boiled down to dollars so that's a whole nother camp it's more of a multi-criteria decision camp that um, it's it's more important to kind of get the process right it's more important to pose to people these plurality of values in their own metrics with good science that backs them up and then allow people to make those tough choices. Ecosystem services in general can't be owned. I can't say uh, the ozone layer is mine unless you pay me I'm not going to let it protect you and you'll get skin cancer. That's physically impossible and many ecosystem services have this characteristic that they can't be physically owned therefore you can't buy them and sell them in markets therefore there's no market price that's generated. Um, so so there's this market failure. The market tends to ignore these ecosystem services. A lot of people say, well, if we can calculate the monetary value of these ecosystem services, we could feed that signal back into the market, and then the market would lead to efficient allocation. One example is using um, the example of coastal wetlands for storm protection. That um, the, if you assemble data on hurricane tracks and the, uh, the area and location of wetlands in the coastal zone and where the urban and rural infrastructure is that, uh, that potentially could be damaged, where populations are, um, as well as the storm intensity. Uh, we can put all that information together and come up with a statistical estimate of the amount of damages that are avoided per, for every hectare of wetlands that are either gained or lost um, in, in the coastal zone. And it turns out to be quite a substantial number in the thousands of dollars per hectare per year. So in, in these two camps, um we often can make these contrasts between a camp that pushes things into dollar valuation really tends to focus on optimization versus a camp that looks at multiple criteria and multiple metrics tends to look at more what you might call compromise you know how do we make compromises uh, the camp that pushes everything into dollar valuation in the tradition of cost-benefit analysis tends to be it doesn't have to be but tends to be very top-down very expert driven Whereas a camp that puts things into its own units, in its own dimensions, in its own spatial and temporal scales, um, has the potential to be more participatory, has the potential to get more people involved in those discussions in the tradition of ecological economics, that transdisciplinary tradition of bringing lots of perspectives to the table. Um, also, this kind of difference between a single metric and multi-metric really cuts at the core of one of the central issues of ecological economics and that's the difference between substitutability and complementarity. In ecological economics we really try to make those distinctions to say that resources that are put into that kind of economic production function have clear limits to substitution and those clear limits mean that there are clear limits also to dollar valuation. Okay? If I can't imagine or think of a clear substitute for an ecological service in a market context, it's probably because a substitute doesn't exist. And very often the relationships between traditional inputs into 
the economic production function and ecological inputs, those relationships are complementary so that um, one more unit of labor or one more unit of human-made capital requires another unit of low entropy matter and energy from the ecological system. You can't have one without the other. You can't make more pizzas by adding more cooks or more ovens. You have to actually have ingredients. And so that notion of complementarity of inputs is really, really, really strong in ecological economics, whereas it's kind of a footnote in traditional economics. And that means that it influences how we do, the, do our valuation business, because, because ultimately if values are incommensurable to, with one another, then they probably are that way for a reason. Essentially, there's kind of three goals for valuing nature. One is to uh, determine the actual monetary value, feed that price signal back into the market, and, um, and then let the market sort things out. Um, that's internalizing externalities. A second is to say, well, let's look at the nas um, national level. Let's look at GMP, for example, or gross national product. We should only look at um, the actual, what we've produced. We subtract from that the harm we've done to ecosystems and uh, uh, natural capital we've used up is, and, um, in comparison to the income on that capital, the interest. So we could adjust national accounts by, um, through valuing nature. And the third is basically just to have something to, com you know, to have some idea of what total, va what values are out there. And just you know, you know, come up with a number for these ecosystems and say, look, you know, here's our GMP. 18 trillion dollars per year um, in the United States, um, or, or should say, look at globally. Here's our GMP is you know maybe I don't know 35 trillion dollars per year. Here's the value of all ecosystem goods and services, and it's 40 trillion dollars per year. And it's essentially we're not saying it's an exchange value. We're not saying if somebody gave us 40 trillion dollars, we give them the planet. Um, we're not saying that it's even really a market value. We're not even saying it's substitutable for nature. It's really a metaphor saying you know we have these value economic values. Well, here's these other values, and um, so it's kind of just a, a metaphor, a signaling device of the importance. There was a major study recently completed called the Millennium ecosystem assessment uh, that looked at the status and trends of ecosystem services globally. Uh, over 1,300 scientists were involved over, over four years, so it's a very voluminous report um, <clears throat> that documents the contribution of ecosystem services of various types to, this, to, to human well-being and the sustainability of that, that well-being. Um, there have been over a thousand papers published, um, you know, on on this topic of ecosystem services, and that rate of publication is is increasing uh, dramatically. So, um, I think this is a core research area for ecological economics, uh, trying to find to to uh, understand that connection between naturally functioning um, ecological systems and and human well-being, and it also forms a a real bridge between the uh, uh, the economic and the ecological uh, side of of, uh, of the system. For the most part, with ecosystems, we're in the arena of pure ignorance. And I'd like to give some examples. What was the monetary value of the passenger pigeon? Well, the passenger pigeon used to be the the um, highest population of a bird species on the planet. Billions of them. They would darken the sky for hours as they flew overhead. And there were so many. They were clearly um, inexhaustible. You know, there was no way to drive those to extinction. And people would just blast away at them for sport, for markets, for, um, you know, just because uh, they were considered pests. There were so many of them. And, uh, and it turned out there was something about uh, passenger pigeon ecology that once their population got down below a few hundred million, it no longer could sustain itself. Apparently the minimum viable population was really high. You know, who knew? But, um, but anyway, they went extinct. And if you think about it, billions and billions of these birds flying over the U.S., what did they eat? They ate acorns, among other things. And so when they were gone, you'd have these huge amounts of acorns that weren't getting eaten by the birds. Well, so, so mice and deer populations boomed that ate those acorns. And when the mice and deer populations boomed, uh, the tick populations that fed on them boomed. And when the tick populations boomed, the spirochete populations that infested the ticks boomed. So 100 years after wiping out the passenger pigeon, we get Lyme disease. That's absolutely unpredictable. There is no way anybody trying to estimate the monetary value of the passenger pigeon could have predicted that it would cause Lyme disease 100 years later. Nobody questions putting monetary values on goods we buy and sell on the market. 
But what is the absurdity of saying that agriculture in the United States contributes 3% to GMP, therefore people assume it must be about 3% of our welfare, leading a Nobel laureate, um, uh, Robert Schelling, to say that uh, basically global climate change doesn't matter much because it primarily affects agriculture, which is only 3% of our GMP, and if we lose one-third of agricultural production, we'll still achieve our GMP goals in 2051 we otherwise would have achieved in 2050. That's an absolutely absurd statement. So for those critics of valuation of uh, um, you know, ecosystem services, et cetera, uh, I really have very little respect for them unless they apply their same criticisms to our valuation of monetary goods and services, which in many ways is equally flawed.